Hey y'all, just to let you know right now you are watching the most honest, the most brutal, the most truthful sports talk show out there with the host HJB, Triple Threat Sports. Enjoy. Alright, so we're in Cambridge here, entering MIT hey, Zone. Hey. That's right. We're going to show... If I wasn't married, I'd be kind of a woman here, but I can't, you know, be married. I can't be, you know, I'm, I'm content. Now. I'm doing this with Triple Threat Sports. Why do you yeah. even bring that up? Alright, no, no. And there's uh, an explosion of information, and it's, it's just multiplying every year. The amount of stuff that's available to us in the front offices, to you all who are interested in the industry, is just growing exponentially, it seems like, every year. Uh, a change in a protein called tau. We all have this protein in our brains, but in the case of CTE, the tau goes awry. And it turns into an abnormal form that then clumps together inside the nerve cells and creates these things, these things called neurofibrillary tangles, as well as astrocytic tangles. And in CTE, it's found all over the brain eventually. But early on, it's found in a couple specific areas. <clears throat> in the frontal lobes up here, in the depths of the cortical cell side. You know how when you look at a brain, it's got these valleys? Well, that's the sulcus, the cell side. And in the depths of those valleys is where this buildup of this abnormal protein starts, but also around small blood vessels in the same area. I'll show you a picture. What's interesting, though, is there's very little of another abnormal protein called amyloid. And that protein is found in Alzheimer's disease along with tau. And this distinction is really important. This is not Alzheimer's disease. I know you all can describe these pictures perfectly to me. Um, these are brain um, microscopic pictures. This is tau, this brown stuff up here is on the surface of the cerebral cortex. These little brown kind of weird shaped things, those are the neurofibrillary tangles inside nerve cells. This is a microscopic enhancement of that sulcus, that valley of the brain, uh, of the outside of the brain. And here is all that buildup of the abnormal tau around it. This white thing is a blood vessel, like a you know, small um, blood vessel, and around it is the abnormal tap. Conversation with Mike, I'll tell you that. So. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, last year I had a chance to come in and, and talk to you all. Uh, and I think some of the, the questions that came from the group were, were you know, how to. I particularly, or how do we as an organization apply some of the methods that you all are so probably more versed than I am, uh, and, and how does this really impact uh, either planning strategy or, or, or other aspects of the game? Um, I think the one thing that I just wanted to bring out in light of that last year is that this year has been obviously very different, but what's been really frustrating at times is that when you try to take all the information that's given to, to us or to me uh, with either mapping out a week's playing time for guys based on matchups, what the projected performance might be for a given guy, uh, the one thing that has really played into this this year is, is youth uh, and experience at the major league level. And, and that is a variable that's probably much greater than we anticipated uh, back Last January, last December, as we're mapping out and planning our roster, building it. And that's not to be critical of the individual guys that have met some challenges along the way. But I think what we're learning is, and there's some gut feel to this, is that what you learn is that uh, that anticipated performance, just because they go from level to level and, and the advancement from A ball, double A, AA, triple A starts to build a little bit, bit of a trend. And you think, okay, we can anticipate this at the major league level. And uh, if, if you don't know, TrackMan is a three. TrackMan is a 3D Doppler radar system. It was born out of missile tracking technology and adapted to sports. Uh, really designed for one-on-one -on -one interaction between a player and a coach. First applied in golf, and we are used by uh, touring pros, coaching pros, equipment manufacturers, broadcasters to track everything to do with the swing path of the golf club, the flight of the ball. Uh, in 2008, we brought it into baseball. In 2011, we, uh, we, after some trial and error, what we found out was that okay, while it's nice to be able to use for coaching, before you can do that, you have to understand the numbers. You have to 
cattle in context with real games, not bullpen. And so our entry into the sport of baseball has been through uh, stadium radar. We're in about uh, 80 stadiums. I really can't tell what stadiums or who we work with or anything like that. But uh, you can use your imagination. But um, now that we have data on the players, it's time to bridge the gap and bring it into the uh, back down onto the field, which is really the DNA of our company. So we've developed a portable radar system, and we've got a, a few of our customers are using it. They have it set up in bullpens. We're also at an amateur event where we have worked with Perfect Game. We're probably in, uh, in probably track five or six hundred amateur games this season alone. Um, but you know, it, it's good to get the game data. But what I want to do is I want to let Brian talk to you a little bit about how a player and a coach would think about applying this. I'm Brian Bannister. Yeah. So I was a very under talented pitcher. Uh, my father was a very good pitcher. He was the number one overall pick in the 76 draft. He threw in 90 little lefty. I was a little second baseman that wasn't fast enough, and so I had to learn how to pitch if I wanted to join the team. So when I made the big leagues my rookie year in 2006, the technology was just coming out. So you get to the big league level, that's not really the ideal place to start learning what all this stuff means. But it's all we had at the time. So we started digging into this data using people like Dan Brooks' website, who was a pioneer in compiling this open source major league data on all these pitches. Um, more importantly, for his business. So you can see it's 80.3 80 miles an hour. His spin rate is uh, 2019. Well, day one of the December convention here in Boston, Science of Baseball convention has been concluded. We have so Astros GM Jeff Bernal, Red Sox GM Ben Sheridan, Red Sox manager John Farrell, Vince Janello gave some presentations. It was uh, a very educational day. Tomorrow we'll be back for part two. I think the better speakers were today, but we'll see what tomorrow looks like. <laughs> so in terms of just an overview, um, again, we'll talk about some microfracture yeah. stuff, cartilage injuries, no, like kind of no, generally speaking, injury. cartilage injuries. Um, Liz Frank injuries, both surgical and non-surgical, and then, you know, kind of throw it around the horn at the end, talk about, like, you know, just all the different positions and um, different injuries that we may or may not have seen this year. In terms of microfracture, you know, for microfractures of surgery, uh, and this is going to, you know, kind of talk generally about cartilage injuries, and with this, specifically talking about articular cartilage injuries, and that's to be differentiated from meniscus injuries. Um, you know, articular cartilage is the surface cartilage on the end of the bone. Meniscus cartilage, which is a little more commonly you might hear about, um, is the shock absorbing cartilage in the knee, and that's a, 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 certainly a procedure we do more often than actual articular cartilage injuries. And why did I pick this one? Obviously, this guy had a few uh, microfractures. This guy's trying to avoid them. That's not going to work out too well. Um, <laughs> He's actually having, he's, I believe, already had his surgery. Had a, he basically had a chondroplasty, which we'll kind of get into what the difference is there. Derek Holland, earlier this year, he had one, apparently tripped on his dog or was running away from a Chuck E. Cheese or something like that. <laughs> um, Willie Bloomquist recently had one. Uh, he hurt his knee running out of ground ball, I believe, and had one early August. They're hoping to have him back sometime early next year. Um, some of these slides are pulled from talks I give to residents, so there's a lot of words that don't necessarily mean anything to anyone, um, but I'll kind of call out the most important stuff. Basically, what is articular cartilage? Again, it's the surface cartilage. It helps to minimize surface tension. It basically helps the joints to glide. Um, also helps with compressive load, so it's a bit of a shock absorber. Again, like in the knee, your primary shock absorbers are meniscus cartilage. Um, but the main thing articular cartilage does is it allows joints to glide smoothly. Um, one of the important things to pull out of this is that 95% of articular cartilage tissue is extracellular matrix, so it's not actually cells. Only 2% of the tissue in surface cartilage is actual cells that have any capability of regenerating or making new cells or regrowing, which is why once you've injured 
a, you know, a surface cartilage area, it's very hard to regrow. The body itself has very little regenerative capacity for regrowing surface cartilage, um, which is why we have to do some of these more advanced surgical techniques sometimes. In children, sometimes you'll see articular cartilage injuries and then they'll regenerate those, but um, you know, in adults, once you're, you know, once you're past the age of skeletal maturity, if you injure your cartilage, it's pretty much a done deal. These cards are awesome, by the way. They give you so much information. Uh, he is 39.070 years old. That is uh, sort of a different specification of age than I am used to. Um, so he is he's, he's a catcher. Uh, he catches a lot. Uh, he catches for the Rays currently. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about him. He's, he's one of the triumvirate uh, Molina brothers uh, who, who are big in the catching world. Um, and yet, if you go look at his... Uh, batting split. So if you go to Baseball Reference, which I, everybody's been to Baseball Reference, uh, you can go and you can look and you can find out what his batting splits are. Um, baseball Reference has a cool uh, summary statistic called OPS Plus, which apparently someone hates, they said so earlier. And yet the basic idea is that, uh, you know, OPS Plus, if it's 100, that's sort of like average. If it's better than 100, uh, that's good, and if it's lower than 100, that's terrible. Uh, so 68 is just about as bad as you can be and still have a job. Um, so, so he's not very good according to the uh, standard batting metrics. Uh, I, when searching, doing this talk, I actually I, I developed my own way to measure uh, offense in baseball, um, which I'm going to call GIP, because we've, we've been talking a lot about FIP today. Uh, GIP is the Google Images Performance Metric. So this is a really simple thing. Uh, there, were, you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion earlier about what you could calculate at home. This you can calculate pretty much anywhere. You, know, you sit on your, your couch and calculate GIP. Uh, what you do is, is you type someone's name into Google Images followed by the word hitting and you see what comes up. So here is David Ortiz hitting according to GIP. And so basically what you see are pictures of David Ortiz either hitting bombs or celebrating bombs. Uh, you know, these are all famous bombs by David Ortiz. Uh, so David Ortiz, really high get. <laughs> Miguel Cabrera, here's another guy. Uh, he's good at hitting. Uh, here's a whole bunch of pictures of Miguel Cabrera hitting bombs. Uh, there's one down here. I don't know what's happening. Uh, that's, 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 that's all conviction. Um, so, so this is Miguel Cabrera. He has a very high gift. So when we type in a Jose Molina gift, <laughs> and the way I can look at this is I was trying to find a picture of Jose Molina hitting. Uh, so, so first, one of the things that's really funny is, uh, so this is actually a picture of Dave Ortiz. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the rest of these X's are pictures of, like, those are not even Jose Molina. Uh, you know, here's Jose Molina running. Uh, this is Jose Molina pointing. Uh, you know, and this is an algorithm which is supposed to be the, the best algorithm in the world for finding the information that you want. Okay, so we got rid of some X's. Uh, then I marked these in yellow because we're creating a new metric. So, uh, so. Um, so these are Jose Molina, Molina sort of hitting, like this is Jose Molina bunting in both of these, and this is a guy that might be Jose Molina hitting, but you can't actually identify it from that picture. Uh, and here's the only one that comes up, so out of one out of ten, so he has a really poor gift. What's the point? Uh, the point is that Jose Molina, you can measure at home, is not a very good hitter. Um, if, if you go, actually, to one of our value stacks, we've been talking a lot about value stacks today. We've been talking about uh, war, warp. Uh, there are various kinds. Uh, we're like that bar in the Blues Brothers, both country and western here at the Sabre Seminar. We've got fan drafts. They rated him as 0.2 wins last year. Baseball reference, 0.1 wins. Baseball prospectus thought he was actually a below average player. That's sad. Uh, conclusions. All websites kind of agree he's terrible. Uh, if you don't like uh, the aggregate value stats, we can ask what's in Jose Molina's bank account. This is his contract information from COTS. These are freely available all over the web, too, at, at COTS. 
uh, and their son at Fangraph. Uh, these are all of Jose Molina's contract information, how much he gets paid. Uh, we decided earlier, I think Ben said $7.28 million was what a win was worth. Uh, he makes $1.8 million for the season. Uh, that's not so good if we think that he's a really valuable player. All right, so that pretty much wraps up this year's 2014 Zipometrics Conference. Uh, we learned a lot of stuff. Well, mostly Joe, because I was sleeping most of the time, honestly. Um, but no, but it was very interesting, and um, we had more big people come out for this year's conference, which was pretty cool. We had a GM of the Astros. We had John Perot come out again. And uh, hopefully next year is as good as this year's and the year before. HJB with Joe, Triple Threat Sports. And we out.